Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. How are y'all tonight? We're working on getting a few things uh, organized or started, so we're trying to get the YouTube feed going right now, and it's being slow. Taking its sweet time. <laughs> Maybe that should be an indicator for something. We actually started that one first. Uh, we're going to give it a minute, and so everybody on uh, YouTube can join us, Lord willing. Because believe it or not, the whole world is not on Facebook. I know, right? It's a shocking thing. Actually, it may be a good thing. It may thing. be a better thing. Yes. Yes. Well, let me try this again. He's going to restart it, which means I have to talk while he's doing. What a way to start, right? <laughs> With technical issues. But we're so glad if you, you're joining us. We're so glad you're joining us. And... Hopefully this will turn out to be a good thing. We want to try to do this every Wednesday night at seven o'clock. And, uh, and if, if there's reasons why we can't do it, we will definitely try to let you know. But as of now, seven o'clock on Wednesday nights. Also, if you are uh, joining us on Facebook, hit the share button, uh, get this out to as many friends as you can. Um, and like it right yeah That's definitely send it do. around definitely send it around as much as you can that is uh i see now it's asking for things that it didn't ask for last time well maybe that's yeah okay. maybe that's a good thing maybe that's a good thing so we're trying to get that up what while he's doing that i'm going to go ahead and tell you what we're hoping to accomplish tonight um, one thing we're wanting to do is share a little bit of our testimony and then uh, talk about our approach to scripture and why that's so important. And we're going to be using scripture to do that. Uh, it's one thing to have a messianic perspective, but if we can't back up what we believe or, uh, or any perspective for that matter, if we can't back up what we believe by scripture itself, then there's a problem. And so we're going to be talking about those two things tonight. And then in, in the following weeks, we're going, to, we're going to talk more and more about discipleship and the importance of that. We're going to be talking about uh, the covenants. If, you, if you've joined us on Shabbat, we've been talking about the covenants, or he's been talking about the covenants quite a bit. Uh, and I, I loved the explanation that Ty gave this last Shabbat on the Godhead. It was absolutely wonderful. And, and it was a perspective I had never heard before. So thank you, Ty, for that. That was really, really good. Yes, it was. So anyway, uh, we're going to be talking more about those things and getting more into the Messianic uh, perspectives and hopefully this is going to be a good experience for all of us. I know that when we teach something, we learn it more. And hopefully as you get into this, hopefully if you want, take notes. Uh, try to hang in there with us. And uh, hopefully we'll all learn something. But again... If you're just now joining us, share and like, right? Share and like. It's an important thing to do. So. Yep. Yep. So we're, we're working on that. Trying to get, we just had a message pop up from somebody saying we don't get Facebook. So yes. That's why I YouTube. mentioned it's also supposed to be on YouTube. But so they're YouTube. getting a little bit more picky all of a sudden for some reason. So we're trying to go through that as quickly as possible. It's got the wheel going, you know, going live, going live, you know. So it's telling us it's doing it. So let's see what happens. Um, is there anything that we need from here? Well, I, I, it needs, I thought I gave it permission to get to the camera. And apparently it's... It's not. So these things are always harder. And with him working, of course, he comes home and he's got stuff to do still from work, paperwork, and so trying to get this set up. 
please bear with us. We're learning about this and um, we're hoping to be able to get on more platforms in the coming weeks. So hopefully that'll happen quickly. But Sorry, I thought I had all this stuff figured out. Why don't you just start telling okay. our testimony a little bit while I work on I this? I will do that. Okay. So I, um, if you've never heard our testimony, it actually begins years ago when Gabriel was just six years old, if you can believe that. Um, so a long time ago. Mariah was just a year and a half. And Gabriel and Kelly went to a Passover Seder. I stayed home with a one and a half year old. Go figure, a Passover Seder, probably a good idea, right? So, especially for the first time. So they went and really, they were really impressed. Kelly was very impressed. Come home with like, why have I never heard this before? And at the same time, I started asking questions about baptism. And that led me uh, into the Jewish mikvah. And that led me into asking, why did Jesus get baptized? And these, these things started culminating together. And that actually led us into more of the feasts. And I did a, um, a woman's conference on the Jewish wedding. Yep. And so it led into that. And all of a sudden, we found ourselves as a Baptist pastor's family doing Passover as a family every yep. year. It made that much of an impression, just going yes. there, hearing some of the symbolism of Jewish people explaining, uh, you know, these are symbols that we grew up with. These are things that we've done our entire life. Uh, but it, they didn't really make sense until I came to know that Yeshua was the Messiah or is the Messiah. And it was only after, really, mm -hmm. for them, it was after Yeshua identifying the correct Messiah that the things that they were doing in their practice in daily life started to make more sense. And they would see the symbolism at work and at play within the pages of the New Testament. And yes. you know, both of us went to seminary, and like you said, uh, this was not the kind of stuff that we got while we were in seminary at all. And a Southern Baptist seminary. So you might be asking, why would a Southern Baptist pastor's wife, who actually went to a Southern Baptist seminary, be asking questions about baptism? Well, I started asking this odd question. You know, in, in Baptist seminary and in Baptist life, we often deal with the how you get baptized, right? It's dunking instead of sprinkling. And so we'll deal with the mode. But I started asking this really strange question of why? Why did he ask us to get wet? Why did he ask us to dunk ourselves? What was it that we were saying to our Heavenly Father when we did this? And so that was more what my question was about along, um, along the lines of why. And that's why it led into those other areas. It just opened up the world to us. And at the time, we didn't know anything about anything called Messianic or anything like that. We didn't know Messianic existed so much. We knew there were Jewish believers, but that's all we knew. And we didn't know anyone around where we were who right. were starting to ask these types of questions and have these types of perspectives. So this was a very slow process for us. He started looking into Jacob. and That was a big one. That was a really big one for us because it opened our eyes up to exactly who Jacob was in that he was a blameless <laughs> man who really did have a heart for God and wasn't this trickster that we had learned about so much. Mm -hmm. And so that even opened our heart up even more to the Jewish people, to Israel. And these things just all started to culminate for us. And we did that. We did a personal family Passover for years. Several years from yeah. like 2007 was our first right. family Passover. And that really continued till well after we moved here to East Tennessee to in 2013. 2013. Yeah. Uh, and then we actually saw that there was a Messianic congregation, a Messianic synagogue in Knoxville that we were able to go to, Shomer Israel. Yes. 
Uh, and the first time we were there, we met some people from our hometown, uh, from here in Newport, uh, where we were at at the time. And, uh, and so we made some, started making connections like, oh, wow, we're not completely right. alone in all of this. And so we started uh, going to Shabbat as a family at uh, Shomer Israel in Knoxville. And a lot of our motivation at the time was it gave us an opportunity to sit down and worship together as a family. Because mm -hmm. as you can imagine, we still had two young kids at the time. And, you know, as a pastor, as a pastor I don't really he's get to always sit. up front. <laughs> And so it was nice to sit down as a family, mother and father with the mm -hmm. children and worship together. And so that was really nice. And so we did that for a while and we learned more and more and more. And all of a sudden, God just parted the water, so to speak. And it was amazing. It was as if what we had been reading our entire lives all of a sudden made sense. Those passages that you would read through and go, okay, yeah, 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 that was for them, this is not for us, or I don't understand this, maybe I'll understand it one day. Those types of passages all of a sudden made sense. And yes, so we went forward with that. And it was amazing to us to experience that. It was we really asked the question, why, Lord? Why, why are you showing us this? Who are we that you would show this to us? And it was, a, and it was amazing for us because we, we knew we weren't anybody special. And all of a sudden, it was like Scripture just came alive and made sense in a way it had never made sense before. And that's very true. I mean, as, you know, even with going to seminary and being educated and all these things there's always issues topics and passages that don't quite fit in the in the box or in the paradigm right. that you've grown up with you know we're all taught biases we're all taught certain ways of interpreting things and uh if if it doesn't fit in the box you just kind of like, i'm not sure what to do about that but that's one of the great things is yeah. you know these messianic perspectives were were had had fewer issues like that that didn't quite Actually, make sense i, I, I don't really I don't know, know of one <laughs> but i mean because all of a sudden all those questions that we had were answered and it was it was amazing so it, right toward the end he added on the idea of torah being relevant to the believer he added on shabbat as yes a command he added on even the food laws that were in the Torah right at the end of a 10 year period. And it was not long after that, uh, that we started Restoration Fellowship. And it actually started as a Bible study in our home and moved over to the church we were at at the time. And it was there for a few months and after Kelly resigned from the church, um, we moved to different locations over in Newport. Mm -hmm. And then in 2018, uh, First Baptist opened up for us to be able to do some things on some of their property. Mm -hmm. And we were very, very grateful for that over in Morristown, Tennessee. And we've been there ever since. It's, it's amazing how God works. So from 2018 until today, we've been at First Baptist in Morristown, Tennessee, and that's been great for us. We now meet in the Fellowship Hall every Shabbat at 1 o'clock. So always come and join us. And uh, it's amazing to us what God has done. When we first started officially as Restoration Fellowship, uh, we were just were wondering what do we call ourselves right mm -hmm. and dennis helton mm -hmm. uh, is the one who is the suggested. suggested restoration fellowship and he was getting it from acts chapter 3 mm -hmm. verse 21 and that's why this is the verse that's on our logo 
and kind of our key verse as a fellowship, Acts 3, 21, it says, he has to remain in heaven until the time comes for the restoration of all things, as God said long ago when he spoke through the holy prophets. The restoration of all things is what we're awaiting. What we are awaiting is the kingdom itself. That is the restoration of all things. When God begins to move things back toward the direction of the Garden of Eden. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I hope you think that this is that, that time. At least it seems like more things are moving in that direction of restoring uh, even his people toward... Yes toward uh, what life in the kingdom is going to be like. Uh, and it's a sense of, if we know that this is how life is going to be lived in the kingdom, then you know we're supposed to be a part of making the kingdom a part of us yes. as much as possible. Uh, not, not because we're trying to be saved, but because we want our life to begin in that kingdom as soon as possible. You know, the kingdom being now, the kingdom being in our heart, and if, if that's the way we're, we're going to live, if that's the lifestyle we're going to have, then I want to have that in my life as much as I can to the extent that I can here in this moment, in this lifetime for this family. Because I'd rather be governed by God and his ways than the ways of this world. And that's not an easy thing to, to do a lot of times. You know, we can get stuck... <laughs> And what we think we believe that it's hard to see uh, other perspectives. And it, it seems to me that all too often we get stuck on those paradigms and we try to pigeonhole everything into a Baptist paradigm or mm -hmm. a Methodist paradigm, Presbyterian paradigm. Reformed, reform. Pentecostal, Take your pick, right? And so, and so what we have here is the idea that when we try to pigeonhole everything into those paradigms, these are the things that separate us. And what God is trying to do is bring us back together, to bring us to one people. That is what Yeshua prayed for. He prayed that his people would be one. And that is really, I think, the, the driving force behind Restoration Fellowship is the calling of being one as his people, the calling of being who he's called us to be, to be more like Yeshua every day. Mm -hmm. That is a blessing. Yeah, because that, that time of restoration is coming. Amen. You know, that it says until the time of the restoration of all things, everything is going to be brought under his feet. Everything is going to be uh, submitted to him. And so, uh, you know, it's that's one of the reasons why we focus on on those things that we know are coming, that are promised, because God is going to keep his promises. And we need to truly believe that as his people. Every day. Every day. Every day. And so we want to live in light of those promises. And one of those promises is the, the mystery of God being fulfilled, the, the, the Jew and the Gentile coming together as one people. And the reality of things is, given how life of the kingdom is going to be, uh, how scripture defines what's going to be happening and how it's going to be operating, um, it's going to look a lot more Jewish the practice of our faith than what we mm -hmm. typically do today, especially in traditional Christianity or the Gentile world. Um, and so we need to start making, uh, it's very eye-opening, let me just say that. Uh, coming from a traditional church, Baptist background, it's been very eye-opening coming in this direction and realizing all the things that we should know but don't and what we should have been hearing about but haven't because those things have been uh, intentionally left out of most of our teaching of, because of decisions that were made centuries ago. And so rather than living in the past and the decisions in the past, coming to scripture with a new, with a 
trying to get as many of our biases yeah. and and perspectives out uh, of the way and then trying to come to the scripture with those fresh eyes without somebody else's interpretation stuck on it. Uh, that's an important thing to do. And so that's why our approach to scripture is so important. Is really I, so I just important. want to say this for a second. Those, those decisions were made centuries ago. And when those decisions were made in the early church by Gentile leaders of the church, they were done on purpose, and many of them were made for anti-Semitic reasons, which is not good. But I, I want to make this very clear, that the pastors who have been teaching this in our lifetime, that was not their situation, and I'm going to say for the most part, because you never know completely about someone, right? These pastors, they're, they're teaching what they have been taught, and... That they uh, we know that because that's where we were at, mm -hmm. and there's there's you know nobody's trying to deceive people out there or anything like that. It's just that that's what they've been taught. That's what's been handed down, mm -hmm. and so we have also got to constantly remember to be gracious to to others, to other believers, to to pastors who are just trying to do their best in terms of what they understand and know. And pastor, mm -hmm. he's shaking to a message. <laughs> I know it's not working for I, I, I for well, some reason. He's I really can't get trying, y'all. He's really, really trying. I don't know what the deal is, but he's trying. And so hopefully it'll it'll come on before this is over. If not, we're really gonna have to work on it this week. Um, we're actually hoping to get, like I said, on more platforms uh, the, in the coming week. Uh, Ty and Tell were telling us about some things that will help us do that. So we're still looking into that. So hopefully that will be cleared up before next week. But, um, again, remember, share and like, everybody. Share and like. Get it out to as many people as you can. So let's go into our perspective of Scripture. Yes. Okay. First, let's start with this idea of, of Scripture, all Scripture being God-breathed and profitable, right? For teaching and correcting and rebuking and training. That would be 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. So that the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work, right? All Scripture. And it is very important. Yes, this is Paul writing to Timothy in what we call the New Testament, but scripture at the time Paul wrote that was the things in the Tanakh, or what most Christians call the Old Testament. So the, all of scripture was profitable for those things and helped to make me, uh, men and women thoroughly equipped for every good work. Remember in John chapter 5, at the very end of the chapter, Yeshua said that Moses wrote about him so that people would know him, right, when he came. And that Moses was the one that was going to testify against them if they didn't believe in him. So, hey, oh, looks, looks oh, like, looks we, got like the YouTube. we might have YouTube coming up. So Maybe. let's hold on just a second here. And it you're live. Says hey, you're live. yay. Okay. Can somebody put out a message for us to everybody that YouTube is up? Uh, you might need to go and just text people instead of putting it on a messenger, obviously. But it'll... YouTube is up. Hello, YouTube. So you can see it. You can look up. If you don't have a link for it, uh, It's you can look up Pastor Kelly Reed. You should be able to see it that way. Uh, you could look up Restoration Fellowship. You should be able to find it that way. Uh, and Actually, then it's hard to find Restoration Fellowship Restor that way. Pastor Kelly Reed and then Restoration or Fellowship is the, the, the best way to find it. That would be the best way. Yeah. So, um, But we have Yeshua saying that Moses wrote about him. So, he, of course, he's referring to the, the Torah itself. And Peter, in, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, tells us that we have everything we need for life and godliness, that God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And so much of what he's referring to there is the Tanakh, the Torah and the prophets and the writings. And so if the Torah and the 
prophets and the writings give us everything we need for life and godliness. If Moses wrote about Yeshua, right? Mm -hmm. And if all scripture is God breathed, mm -hmm. then we need to take what the Torah and what the Tanakh says very, very seriously. And on, you know, because with that, you know, all scripture being God breathed is for teaching, right? That's, that's the equivalent of instruction, which is what Torah mm -hmm. really means. Most of y'all should know that. So it's, it's appropriate for teaching, for reproof. What is yes. reproof? Reproof? Reproof, isn't that where you're having to have some things change? You know, he talks about uh, correction. Reproof means like we need to have some, our lives called. So if we're doing something wrong, the scripture is what reveals what we're doing wrong, reproof. Mm -hmm. And for restoration, for training in righteousness, for correction, where we don't just need to be told we're wrong, we need to be shown how we're wrong, but also how to get back on the right track. Mm -hmm. And then what comes, what is right doesn't come natural to our fleshly body. So we need that training in righteousness. Uh, and especially as Gentiles, we don't know the standard that scripture has for this is what righteousness is. It's his Torah, it's his word that teaches us what is righteousness in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of man, because they're not always the same thing. In fact, frequently they're not. That's, that's right. You know, God does not change, and Yeshua does not change. Scripture says that Yeshua is the same yesterday, today, and forever in the book of Hebrews. But one thing we tend to believe in a lot, a lot of times within traditional Christianity is that scripture somehow has changed that his word has changed in in the sense that certain things don't necessarily apply to us mm -hmm. we say that a lot we say that a lot or you know that okay well that was for back then this is today this is for the church age yeah right make so, some divisions between time right and, so in that sense there's a change there Right? Of how we approach and apply the right. scriptures. Not right. that the word is changing, but what we think about it and how we apply it, how we use it, how we allow it to work in our lives. And that's the problem. That is the problem. Okay. So let's take a look at what scripture has to say about itself. If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah chapter 40, and this is an idea that Peter even echoes in uh, 1 Peter, but let's go to where it comes from. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 40, if I can get there. Um, let's see here. Let's start in verse 6. We're going to read 6, 7, and 8, okay? You want to read that? Sure. And this is out of the TLV. It says, a voice is saying, cry out. So I said, what shall I cry out? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades, for the breath of Adonai blows on it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. Did you catch that? The flowers fade, the grass fades people, but people come and go, come and go. Um, we we still have death in our world um, but the word of God it stands forever mm -hmm. so if God has spoken it it stands forever you know the thus saith the Lord does not perish does not go away okay and again yeah. this is a verse that Peter repeats References. No, he repeats, he repeats it. He repeats it um, in verse in, or in First Peter chapter one, verses twenty four and twenty five. I think that's very important for us to understand. You know, again, you know, oh well, that's the Old Testament. No, the the Word of God stands forever. It does not change, and we'll get into that in just a minute. Yeah, is there ever a time where? Thus saith the Lord says, okay, well, he, he must not have meant that. No. I don't think so. Never. 
Okay, so let's go to uh, Psalm chapter 119. We have a few verses to look at that, talking about the eternal, uh, the eternity of the Word of God. Psalm 119. Psalm 119. We're going to just kind of go through the There's chapter a little so bit. so many choices in okay, this psalm. Yeah. <laughs> um, let's start with verse 89. There is a really good verse on that the law or the Torah is freedom mm -hmm. in verses 44 40. and 45. But we're going to look at the fact that God's word is forever. So let's go to verse 89 and then go down to 91. 89 says this. This and I have the complete Jewish Bible, okay? Your word continues forever, Adonai, firmly fixed in heaven. Your faithfulness through all generations, you established the earth, and it stands. Yes, it stands today in keeping with your rulings, for all things are your servants. Here we see that the eternity of the word of God is actually connected to the fact of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. And we'll, we'll see that again in the New Testament in just a minute. And, and with that, though, also, uh, before I forget, I have a tendency to forget my thoughts if I don't get them out. So, um, <laughs> but if it's his word stands firm in the heavens. Yeah. So do we have access to it in order to be able to modify or or make amendments no, we're gonna get into that in just a minute oh okay i forgot we're gonna get into i said that okay. we're gonna get into that in just a minute we'll get to those verses in, in in just a little bit so let's go on to verse 96 and Skip i want us head. to yeah i know you see what happens i see the limits of all perfection but your mitzvah your commandments has no end or has or has no bounds. It's boundless. Boundless. It's boundless. It just keeps going, right? The mitzvah have no bounds. Okay? And so it's it just keeps going. It has, it's it's eternal. All right, let's go to 142. You want to read that one? Sure. It says your justice is righteousness forever and your Torah is truth. Now go to 44. And your testimonies are righteous forever. Make me understand so I may live. So just, if his justice is righteousness forever and your Torah is truth, how long does that truth last? And we'll get into that in just a second. Okay, in a so, couple more verses. I see, had something brilliant. There. I know you did. Okay, but you're going to be able to see in just a minute when we actually read something about that. Okay, but I, and one thing that's interesting and the difference between uh, my version and your version is that in 44, mine says your instruction is righteous forever. Hmm. Hmm. What does Torah mean again? It means instruction, right? So we have that the fact that his righteousness is eternal, his Torah is truth. And his instruction is righteous forever. Okay, let's go down to verse 52. 152. I'm going to go to 50, 151. One, yeah, 151 and 152. Okay. You are close by Adonai, and all your mitzvot are truth. Mm -hmm. So we have what is truth? Torah. Torah is truth. And we have your commandments are commandments truth. Commandments are truth. Long ago, I learned from your instruction mm -hmm. that you established it forever. How about that? So his Torah is truth, his mitzvah is truth, and his instruction is forever. Now let's go to verse 160. This one is where we're going to get back into what you said a little bit. Okay, so be ready to jump in here. You ready? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the main idea about your word is that it is true. And all your just rulings last forever. Mm -hmm. This one has a good translation of that too. It says, mm -hmm. truth is the essence of your word and mm -hmm. all your righteous rulings are eternal. So when Torah is truth and the thing about his word is that it is true. Mm-hmm. 
right? And it's eternal and his rulings last forever. Notice the different aspects of the Torah that is saying last forever. The rulings, the mitzvot, the instruction, mm -hmm. right? I.e. the Torah itself as a whole not broken up you might hear people talk about the moral law ceremonial law the judicial law and those things that they could uh interpret because they weren't directly they weren't very specific about god mm -hmm. wasn't very specific about um there's the priestly law um but People will say that the moral law doesn't change, but maybe the ceremonial law has changed, or part of the judicial law has changed, mm -hmm. right? We, it, or we are no longer governed by those things, right? Is what people will many times many times say because they don't really what that reveals is they don't want to be governed by those things. But all those things are forever. The, the scripture does not make those kind of distinctions no. to let you off or let you. Uh, decide which ones you're going to keep. Now, there are some, obviously, that apply to her that don't apply to me as a woman. Right. Or there's some that apply to me that don't apply to her as a man. There's some things that apply to farmers that don't apply to everybody else. There's something specific for the land of Israel itself that we can apply outside the land as practice, but specifically there for the land itself, and, and typically to farmers. And they're all typically mixed in together they are yes. oftentimes found right next to each other mm -hmm. because all of those issues are seen as god's torah god's instruction mm -hmm. and it's not really trying to separate it out and say that this is this is for this period of time only or it's not or this is just for some of the people but not all of the people in that sense in the sense right. of there's going to be a future time where my people are not going to be governed by this stuff you know, what's interesting is I've been teaching a U.S. history class. Mm -hmm. And last semester, we were going through the Constitution. And we finally got to the end of the semester to the amendments and the Bill of Rights. And, you know, in our Constitution, we can we have the provision of making amendments. Right. There is a process right? built into the system. Which means we can actually even change something within the Constitution. And actually amendments, the first two amendments that do that are 11 and 12, right after the um, Bill of Rights. Change something about the actual text of the Constitution. Our founding fathers realized that they were not writing the Word of God, right? Mm -hmm. That what they were doing may not be completely perfect. They were basing it on the on the word of God, mm -hmm. but may not be completely perfect. God's word, however, is eternal. It stands forever. Mm -hmm. It is boundless. It's in heaven. It's in heaven. <laughs> Firmly established in heaven. But what about making amendments? Can we change things? Can the church uh, see some things that maybe not work with our perspectives and kind of tweak some things to kind of fit us Gentiles or fit the church age. We're modern. We're smarter than that. Right. And so can we do that? Does the scripture give us permission to do that? Like our constitution gave, um, gave the people of the United States permission to do. Well, the answer to that question is no. No. Matter of fact, if you'll turn to Deuteronomy chapter 4. Verse 2 and then 5 through 8. Okay. Deuteronomy 4, 2 says, You must not add to the word that I am commanding you or take away from it in order that in order to keep the mitzvot of Adonai your God that I am commanding you. And then verse 5, See, just as Adonai my God commanded me, I have taught you statutes and ordinances to do in the land that you are about to enter to possess. You must keep and do them, guard and do them. For it is your wisdom and understanding in the eyes of the peoples, that's the other peoples, the other nations, who will hear all these statutes and say, 
Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So God's law, his Torah, his instruction and way of life is supposed to be a magnet. A witness. A witness. And it's supposed to draw the other nations. It's like, man, I wish we had ones like that. Um, but it goes on. It says, for what great nation is there that has God so near to them as Adonai our God is whenever we call on him? What great nation is there that has statutes and ordinances that are righteous like all of this Torah that I am setting before you today. I mean, why would they be drawn to it? I was like, man, you guys, you guys have the best uh, way of life. You have the best laws. Your God is so awesome in what he has provided for you. And that's amazing. But boy, we sure don't want to live that way ourselves. I mean, does that, does that, that make, make sense? sense? That doesn't make that's sense. That's not for us. We, we right. know it's great for you, but we really don't want those. And so we, right here, God is saying to, through Moses, do not add, do not subtract. You do not have permission to amend my word. Mm -hmm. If it's inconvenient for you, to you, oh well. Well, you can either come and submit yourself to it and live by it. Or you can say, you know, all the Lord has said we will do and obey. Or you say, well, I guess that's not for me. Right. Remember when Moses went up on the mountain the second time when he wanted to see the glory of God? Uh, a second time, I should say, for 40 days and 40 nights, because he went up more than twice. Um, as we talked about recently with our Bible study group, uh, the Torah Club, he went up seven times mm -hmm. altogether. But for the second time when he went up for 40 days and 40 nights, and he wanted to see the glory of God, and he's going, I'm not going anywhere unless you go with me, right? Well, he makes a very interesting statement, and you might have heard me talk about this before, but he asked God, to, to, God, teach me your ways so that I can know you. Mm -hmm. The ways of God help us know him. The ways of God reveal his character. So if we change something about the word of God, the ways of God, we are in essence saying, God, I want to change you. Mm -hmm. And that was something I was also wanting to come back to. If we say, you know, we look at those laws and those things, those way of life, and we say that's great for you, but we don't want that. We're not really rejecting the way of life. We're not really rejecting um, the, the Torah. We're actually rejecting those things of God that these things reveal. Mm -hmm. We are rejecting him. And it's a lot like that moment with, uh, with Samuel when the, the Israelites were asking for a king. Mm -hmm. You know, God came to them and said, it's like, you know, don't be upset that they're doing this. They're not really rejecting you, Samuel, as the appointed leader. They're rejecting me as their king. That's, that's the bottom line of things. And so when we say we don't want these or we, these are not for us, we are saying the same thing that he is not really our king. Yeah. We and want to change who he is. We don't understand the implications of what we're saying, you know, in traditional theology by saying that that's not for us. And remember, Moses wrote about Yeshua, mm -hmm. right? And Yeshua is the word. He's the living word. So if we change the word, we are in essence trying to change mm -hmm. him. That is a very important concept for us to remember. Uh, this idea of do not add or do not subtract, we find it again in Deuteronomy 13, verse 1. Mm -hmm. If you're using one that's based on the Jewish numbering, if you're using a traditional Christian Bible, it's the very last verse of chapter 12. So when you, when you come to that idea of do not add, do not subtract, we see that in the Torah, but we also see that idea actually in the book of Revelation when God tells them, do not add anything to this book or I will add the, to you, the, curses. the curses in this book, mm -hmm. right? So when we try to insert something that is not there, we are doing a disservice to the word of God. So three times within scripture, three times, God repeats this idea of do not adding, 
things mm -hmm. to his word. And of course, that calls us back to when twice he said, do not add, do not subtract, right? Mm -hmm. So three times he's saying, do not add. Two times he's saying, do not subtract. I think this idea is pretty important to him. Because only God has the authority to speak the word and only he would have, have any authority to change it. But since his word stands forever and his character is the same yesterday, yes, today, today, and forever, forever. <laughs> once he says it, it's not going to change. Right. Because if it was ever going to change in that manner, then he would not have spoken it. And so when we even talk about Yeshua changing, changing something, we have to be very careful because when we talk about Yeshua changing something, for example, the food laws, right? Not only are we changing him in essence, mm -hmm. but we are also making him a lawbreaker. Mm -hmm. Because if scripture tells us not to add or subtract and he added or subtracted from what his father said, that would make him a sinner according to scripture. Mm -hmm. And therefore, a he would not be a spotless lamb. Mm -hmm. He would not be that perfect sacrifice. We cannot do that to him. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is the spotless lamb. He upheld every word his father has spoken. He upheld his own character. Mm -hmm. That is who he is. And he was, remember scripture says he was born under the law. He was born within the Jewish lineage and under the law. He was subject to all of those things. Mm -hmm. And so for him to change any of it would have made him a sinner. A sinner and in the eyes of the Jewish people. A false prophet. Yes, very much so a false that's, that's prophet. That's Deuteronomy 13 mm -hmm. is a lot about that. Because yes. even that passage, that chapter, it says, you know, even if he comes and performs signs and wonders and miracles and does all these other things, and he, then, but then he tells you, let us go after other gods. Which, or, which actually Deuteronomy 11 makes clear that, that not obeying Torah, not being obedient to the ways of God is going after other gods. Yeah, because all, all the other gods have their own ways yes. and their other expectations for their people. But if you're going to be following the God of the scriptures, then these are the ways that he wants us to live. And so if you're changing his, the ways, then you're changing your God. And so as believers, if we say that Yeshua or Jesus changed something, well, a Jewish person is going to hear that and go, uh-huh, false prophet and it's no wonder that many of them will say oh jesus he's he's you know a gentile god mm -hmm. right he's some greek gentile god you know he's not for us when he's the one very much for the jewish people to mm -hmm. the jew first and then the gentile right so sometimes we have to examine the implications of the things that we might have grown up hearing right. or believing or saying is like, okay, if that's true, what does that really mean? What does that say about him? What does that do? What are the implications of that? And uh, that's been an approach that we've had mm -hmm. even in looking in some of the decisions that were made centuries ago in church history. Right. You know, we've asked a couple of questions related to that. You know, one of them was if, if something is in the scripture that it tells us to do, and for whatever reason, we as the believing community, we're not doing it. Why aren't we doing it? And when did we stop doing it? When and why? Why aren't we and when did we stop? And then the flip side question of that is, if something is in the scripture and is telling us not to do it, but we are doing it, why are we doing it and when did we start? Yeah. And when you look at church history uh, through those kind of questions, it, it can be a very eye-opening and sometimes disturbing yes. uh, view of how we got here. Uh, and so, again, that's, that's trying to see through our biases and our practices, yes. you know, the orthodoxy. And to look at things honestly. Yeah. I mean, because they didn't get everything wrong. That's right. I mean, there's, there's orthodox is the right belief. Mm -hmm. Orthopraxy is what's called the right practice right. or activity. And like you said, they didn't get everything wrong but they didn't get everything right. right. 
and that's that's the same thing with Jewish tradition and a lot of the uh, the the rabbinic culture. You know, they they got uh, a lot of things right. They got some things wrong. So we have to test everything. You know, that's it's, it's interesting to me when when if if you ever um, listen to Jewish rabbis, um, Orthodox Jewish rabbis, so so many times if they're not directly confronting Yeshua. Yeshua? <laughs> Wow. How right they are about scripture in many, many ways. And even in times messianic king, and, kingdom yes. stuff. Yes, and because it's all in the Tanakh anyways for the most part, right? But anyways, the, the whole idea of, uh, as long as they're not talking about Yeshua, I mean, they can even sound like they're talking right out of the pages of the New Testament, Mm -hmm. You know, how right they are about who the Messiah would be. And what Messiah was going to do and mm -hmm. the kind of world or life we're going to have in the kingdom. Or who so, we should be yeah. as the people of God. And it's spot on. And, until they start directly confronting Yeshua and, oh, no, no, not him. But not him. Not him. So we have to remember the implications of what we say about Yeshua is very, very important. Mm -hmm. It's very important. So let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Mm -hmm. yep. I'm already there. I, I saw that. You want to read it? Sure. And most of y'all are familiar with this passage. It's Matthew 5, 17. This is, this is Yeshua's attitude mm -hmm. and perspective toward the Torah, toward the Word of God, toward the Tanakh, the, what we would traditionally call the Old Testament. It says, do not think that I came to abolish the Torah or the prophets. So there's authority in both of those, which was a debate even in his day. It says, I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. And there's a, a big meaning behind that word, which we often get wrong in traditional theology. It says, amen, amen, I tell you, until heaven and earth pass away. Where was the Torah rooted? Uh, what, exact, well, you know, remember that verse in Psalm, Psalm 119? 119? One of the Torah. Firmly established in heaven, right? And also connected to earth, mm -hmm. okay? So until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or seraph shall ever pass away from the Torah until all things come to pass. Therefore, and this is the key, especially when we go around trying to change things. Therefore, whoever breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches others the same as if I'm going to break them and so should you. You now have permission to break these things. Mm -hmm. That's a problem in Yeshua's eyes. So they shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And there's some major implications with that statement about Yeshua, considering how we talk about him. Because uh, if he changed something, we've made him... We have made him the least. least. We have made so him the least in the kingdom careful. by our own teaching and our own theology. By his, he is convicted by his own words at that point that mm -hmm. we have just made him the least in the kingdom. And I'm, I, for one, don't want to do that. Amen to that. Uh, so they shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven, but whoever keeps or guards uh, and teaches them. So teaches them what? Teaches them that they can keep it or they, if they want to or that, that they should. They should. So if you keep and teaches them, this one shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So if Yeshua, who is great? Who's the greatest? Who's the, yeah. <laughs> if Yeshua is the greatest, then he is going to be teaching everyone to keep and do. And we should have a big amen on that one. Yeah. <laughs> right? A big says, amen. For I tell you in verse 20, that unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees and Torah scholars, you shall never enter the kingdom of heaven. You know, there's something about that because my righteousness does not. Mm -mm. And even their righteousness mm -mm. is not enough. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. No. But there is one whose righteousness is enough. And is perfect. And is perfect. And that is Yeshua himself. Yes. All right. And that idea of heaven and earth, we also see that idea in Deuteronomy chapter 30. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, Moses says, I call on heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have presented you with life and death, the blessing and the curse. Therefore, choose life so that you will live, 
you and your descendants, loving Adonai your God, paying attention to what he says and clinging to him, for that is the purpose of your life. Mm -hmm. Heaven and earth are witnesses against us that we do not keep his word. And until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest stroke, nothing is going to pass away from his word. In other words, it still applies. Right? And we may have a new heaven and new earth in the kingdom, and we may have a new heaven and new earth in, in eternity. Heaven may come down. Mm -hmm. But remember, it's firmly established in heaven forever. Mm -hmm. Right? And so these things are very important for us to understand. The word of God is there for us to obey, loving the Lord our God, paying attention to what he says, and clinging to him, mm -hmm. right? What does Psalm 119 also say? This is a verse we all know. Your word is a lamp unto my, my feet, feet and a light unto, unto my path. path. His word, his ways are what direct us, are what direct our ways and what directs our paths. So if we're going to walk properly, we have to follow the ways of God. And his ways are not burdensome for us. That's also what Deuteronomy chapter 30 says. And John in 1 John chapter 5 actually reiterates that idea that the ways of God, the, the word of God, the commands of God are not burdensome for nope. God's people. Nope. Right? And so when, when we talk about the word of God, when we talk about who Yeshua is and what he did and what he taught, we have to remember <clears throat> that we are giving witness to the character of God. Mm-hmm. And so I don't want to read and approach the scriptures as a Baptist. God is Who true. He is. He is true. I don't want to approach the scriptures as a, we shouldn't want to approach the scriptures as a Presbyterian, as a Pentecostal, as, as any one of the labels that we have and every on man ourselves. A liar. Uh, every man is a liar. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. We, we need to put those things aside and approach the scripture for who he is and what it says about him. And so that, and you know, the, the Jewish people have been studying these things a lot longer than we have. And they have a lot of things that, that we have not considered uh, or have even heard of before. Because we didn't think they were worth listening to. Because they did, we didn't think they were <clears throat> worth listening to. But there, there's is a culture that's different from ours. There's is our references that they understand that that we do not right. going all the way back to that Seder presentation that my son and I attended when we first got started. There are things that a Jewish person would be able to see and understand and recognize that I was completely oblivious to. And so there are there are things in the scriptures that he wants us to know. And because we are, you know, it's a restoration of all things as things are approaching the kingdom. One of the great miracles of our day in our time is, you know, more Jewish people have come to faith in Messiah in the last 60 years, you know, roughly since, lo and behold, since 1948 and people Especially got back into the land in 67 when they got hold of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. uh, more Jewish people have come to faith, come to recognize Yeshua as the Messiah in since then than since really the first century. Yeah. And so they're bringing back with them a wealth of knowledge and understanding uh, of the scriptures and the life and the practice of this is what this life looks like. And, uh, and so we as Gentiles are living in an era and a day where we are privileged to be able to learn them. Mm -hmm. And some of the things that maybe we've been blinded to in our experience are being removed. And remember as believers, our goal should always be to be more like Yeshua, to be transformed into the image of the son that he loves. Yep. Who was Yeshua? How did he live? You know, it's not what would Jesus do? It's what did Jesus do? You know, and, and these things are very important for us to remember that 
he is our model. If he did it, we should do it. And yes, we are not perfect at it like he was, but that does not mean we, we don't strive to be like he was. You know, it's, that's, that's because so Because he still is remember. that person. Yes, he is. And when he comes back, he he's will, still he's going to be still that be same that person. person. You know, he is going to be the he king. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's going to be the king of the the nation, and he is going to be the high priest of the nation that is living by the ways of God. And uh, whose ways the other nations look at and go, I want that. Can we, can that. we, can we, be can we participate in that? By that. And what's going to happen in the kingdom? Israel is going to pretty much engulf the world. The kingdom of God is going to engulf the, the world. The, the authority and the ways of the king of Israel are going to engulf the globe. And so, yeah, that that's if 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 the nations look on those ways and see the king ruling in righteousness. In righteousness. And holiness. Oh, but we're so close to that today with all of our world leaders, aren't we? How about no? Not no. so much. <laughs> but yeah, this this is this is gonna be what even the world is going to ask for. And yet at the same time, unfortunately, he's going to have to rule with an iron scepter mm -hmm. on some things at least. So we need to be modeling our life now because we are practicing for our eternity remember moses said this is the purpose of your life to love god to obey god right mm -hmm. and of course yeshua told us to be witnesses for him and we cannot be a good witness for him if we are changing who he is so that's kind of a bit of our testimony and our approach to scripture and how it's changed in the last 15 years, oh, yeah. um, but I think it's, it's definitely changed for the better. So everyone, remember, YouTubers, remember to like and to share the video. Facebook, we've said that a couple of times, so I don't think we need to say that to you again. <laughs> but everybody, try to get this out there and that idea of, of and the importance of realizing that what we say and what we believe it has implications, and we yes. need to be very careful. And we're going to be, again, trying to do this every Wednesday night at 7 o'clock. I uh, would enjoy you all coming back for it and being a part of it. And if there's questions or there's issues or things that you want us to address, uh, make those into comments. Send them our way through an email, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll come to them at some point. Yes. Uh, we don't want to miss that. Of course, you're always welcome to come to the the services mm -hmm. uh, at First Baptist Church in downtown Morristown, Tennessee. And uh, that's one o'clock on Shabbat on Saturdays. Uh, we'd love to have everybody there for that. And actually we will be having our Passover there. Yes. Yes, in April um, on Passover, April 15th. Um, so if you wanna join us for Passover, let us know that as well. Absolutely. All righty. Maybe we can convince some people to come visit us from Texas and, and sing some songs for us there. That would be nice. <laughs> All right. Let me close in prayer. Yes. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe. Father, we do acknowledge that you are King and ruler of everything, and we want you to be King and ruler of our lives. So Lord, just show us your favor, show us your grace, and continue to, to fill us with your spirit so that we may walk in your ways in your laws, in your commands. Lord, we need your strength for that. We need your power for that because we can't do it on our own. We need to be taught in righteousness. So Lord God, your word will do that. And we praise you for giving us your word. We thank you for opening our eyes, Lord, and may we just ever be drawn closer to you. Lord, may you provide health and strength and wisdom for your people. And Lord, just... Be at work in us and give us opportunity to glorify your name. We ask this in the name of Yeshua. Amen. Y'all have a good and blessed night. All right. Good night, everybody. Bye.